Um, hello, everybody. Thank you, everyone, for coming to our talk. Uh, my name is Izu, and I'm an, the head of Innovation Forum Cambridge. Um, today, we'll be talking about gene therapy with two really, really wonderful uh, speakers. So first, I just wanted to take a minute to talk about uh, the Innovation Forum. So the Innovation Forum is basically a, glass, uh, a grassroots uh, network of uh, both innovators and entrepreneurs. And what we aim to do is to uh, trans translate uh, innovations into uh, products. Um, and uh, how do we do this? Is we have one uh, really uh, flagship uh, event, and that's the Imagine If uh, Global Accelerator. Uh, it's a, basically a competition and accelerator program for startups um, to get uh, funding as well as uh, mentoring, mentorship. So if you wish to uh, know more about this, please can you uh, Um, okay, so Sophia, can you please introduce our two speakers today? Yes, hello. Uh, so today we have two speakers, as mentioned, both from CGT Catapult. First up is Dr. Jonathan Appleby, uh, who joined CGT Catapult as the Chief Scientific Officer in 2018. Prior to this, he was the CSO for Cell and Gene Therapy at GSK's Rare Diseases Unit, where he also led the team that developed and launched Stromvelis, which is the multi-award winning and first autologous stem cell gene therapy to be approved for commercial use. Prior to this, Jonathan was the director and portfolio manager at the GSK Center of Excellence for external drug development. Jonathan has worked in all phases of medicine development from discovery to launch and has decades of industry experience in both conventional and advanced therapy medicinal product development. And our second speaker for the day will be Dr. Dr. Jacqueline Barry, who joined CGT Catapult as the Director of Regulatory Affairs and is now currently the Chief Clinical Officer. Prior to this, Jacqueline held a number of postdoctoral academic posts at the University of Edinburgh, studying neuromuscular regeneration, and subsequently worked at the Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service in a number of senior regulatory and quality positions. She has considerable experience in the development, translation, clinical trial, and approval of cell based medicinal products and therapies. So Jack and Jonathan, thank you both for coming here. Um, if you're ready to share your slides, the floor is yours. Yeah, and if you have any questions, please feel free to type. Jonathan, would you like me to share the slides? Um, Jonathan, I think you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfectly. Yeah. Okay, I think when uh, you muted everybody, I, I went on mute at the same time, so apologies for that. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Innovation Forum talk uh, this evening. Um, if we could just go to the first slide, please. I'm going to talk to you for about 25 minutes, uh, and I'm going to give you a little introduction to the cell and gene therapy catapult, and then we'll talk in much more detail about gene therapy platforms and then I'll hand over to Jackie, who will take you through some of the challenges that we've got when it comes to actually adopting these revolutionary medicines into the healthcare environment. So just before we get on to the main topic, um, to let you know that the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult is one of several catapults in the United Kingdom, and it's a network of innovation, innovation centres center. which is funded by Innovate UK, and the objective of those centers is to work in areas of uh, novel technologies and to enhance the way they make it through to the market and then to help those markets grow. You can see that we have uh, a number of sites down in the south and uh, there's a geographic spread for the whole of the Catapult network. Next slide, please. As I've mentioned, our objective is to help businesses start, grow and develop. And we have a number of facilities that we have developed at the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult to enable us to do that. And importantly, 
The Selim Jintabi catapult is not for profit, which means that we receive some government subsidy to help us in our mission. And it means that we don't take a long term vested interest in the financial return of the companies or academics that we help. And that enables us to work in a, a non biased fashion. Next slide, please. So when it comes to cell and gene therapy, the role of the catapult is to first work out what are the barriers that prevent growth in the field. And what we see outlined on this slide here are broadly three main areas that the catapult focuses on to make those people who are trying to develop cell and gene therapies their life easier. We have uh, a group focused on health economics. That's probably this, one of the smaller areas in terms of the resources that we apply, but it's actually fundamentally important. And Jackie will talk in great depth about this later on, but essentially it's about understanding the marketplace into which you want to introduce your new treatments, understanding the development costs associated with that, and whether you've got a commercially sustainable model. Working backwards really from that position, we also provide support in regulatory and clinical development issues. And again, Jackie can talk about those things. It's um, part of her uh, role at the Catapult. But my role and where a lot of the Catapult's focus actually comes is on manufacturing and supply. Cell and gene therapies are unusual in the fact that they're extremely complicated to control in manufacture. And this presents a major barrier to the whole of the industry. So we invest a lot of our time and effort in trying to resolve that. Next slide, please. In order to do that, we have uh, the Manufacturing Centre at Stevenage, which is a suite of clean rooms that third party companies can come in to do their manufacturing. And we recently became involved with the Manufacturing Innovation Centre at Braintree, which is actually a vaccines manufacturing site using the catapult knowledge to help set that up as part of the COVID national response. But really today we're focusing on the development centre where I'm accountable for the running of 1,200 square metre site uh, with laboratory space in built. And we focus principally on process and analytical development, really the details of how to make these cell and gene therapies, uh, focusing a lot on viral vectors, different lenti and AAV, which you'll hear about shortly, but also obviously covering stem cells, which is not the topic of the talk today. Jackie runs... Uh, uh, a group of experts that cover regulatory and non-clinical, or sometimes called preclinical uh, testing, and as I've mentioned, health economics, clinical trials, and the advanced therapies treatment network, which uh, Jackie will talk about addressing many, many of the challenges that are associated with adoption of these radical new treatments. Next slide, please. So that's an overview of the catapult. Um, and what I'm going to do now is switch tack and talk much more about the topic that uh, the, the title has laid out, which is gene therapies and uh, where have we really got to with those. Very broadly speaking, there are two approaches to gene therapy. The kind of obvious one, in vivo gene therapy, simply taking your, well, I say simply, taking your vector and injecting it into the body in order to try to transduce your target tissues. And there are many challenges with doing that. So there's also a separate field of gene therapy called ex vivo gene therapy, where you take the cells out of the human body and you do your genetic engineering externally, and then you put the cells back. So I'm just going to focus on in vivo gene therapy first, because it exemplifies the reasons why one would go to all the trouble of developing an ex vivo platform. So the cystic fibrosis gene was discovered, I think, in, in the late 80s. And um, everybody jumped on it very quickly because you would think the lungs are quite an easy target to get to from um, a pharmacotherapeutic perspective. There are viruses which we know attack the lungs, uh, very present given uh, the COVID-19 pandemic now, of course. And then, so it seemed like this would be a revolutionary new approach for treating genetic diseases. And uh, the one of the first studies done in this space was of course, cystic fibrosis, uh, CFTR, cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator gene with a gene called, with a, a virus called adenovirus, 
which is a, a normal virus that infects humans, the respiratory tract, um, but it didn't work. And the reasons that it didn't work became unfortunately tragically clear later after a few more years and iterations of effort with a tragedy involving a gene therapy in a different disease, uh, a metabolic disease of the liver actually, where injection of large concentrations of the coronavirus actually caused a fatal immune reaction in a young, relatively healthy boy called Jesse Gelsinger. And that put a big break on the field of in vivo gene therapy, as we learn about the immunogenicity of the viruses, which can come in a number of different forms. You can have pre-existing autoimmunity to these viruses, or you can induce an immune response because the virus infects the cell, the capsid to the outside of the virus then gets expressed on the outside of the cell via MHC class one, and then T cells will come along and attack those cells. And this has proven to be a real major challenge for the field to get through, which has dramatically slowed the amount of progress. You can see on the slide a couple of examples of where the immunogenicity of that particular virus has actually turned to the advantage of the product. Everyone knows it's easier to smash things up and kill things than it is to mend things and nurture things. So perhaps not surprisingly, the first uh, iterations of, of successful gene therapies came with uh, cancer treatments using adenovirus to deliver payloads, which induce an immune response, which cause the, the cells to die or to be attacked by a um, uh, other cells of the immune system, such as genesin and oncarine. They, they weren't launched or developed in Europe. And neovascular gen was actually a gene therapy developed in Russia involving the direct injection of naked DNA into the bloodstream where a small amount of the, the DNA is, is claimed to transfect cells of the, the blood lining and uh, prevent some of the, the vascular disease, again, not launched in Europe. So it wasn't until uh, a lesser known um, non-pathogenic virus called AAV, a then associated virus was discovered that the breakthroughs began to occur. So um, it, it somewhat fortuitously, AAV was discovered as um, a residual or a contaminant in an adenovirus preparation. It's a, it's a small, um, probably about two, uh, 20 nanometer virus, which has a small genome. It can't replicate on its own. It can only replicate in association with an infection from adenovirus, um, which makes it quite a good vector because it's non-replicative and it's relatively non, it's not been associated with any disease. And, and round about, um, 2011, we started to see some good results in the liver following intravenous injection. It's a natural target, natural tropism for AAV. Some progress in haemophilia. Glibera, many of you will have heard of, was approved for lipoprotein lipase deficiency in 2012. It didn't work particularly well, um, and it, didn't, it wasn't a commercial success being withdrawn from the market by Unicure in 2017, but it was a massive step forward in terms of learning how to make, regulate, and administer and look after the patients that have received a gene therapy. So although it wasn't a commercial success, it was a very important development for the field. And since then, we've gone on to learn more about different capsid types that can be directed to different target tissues with a certain amount of specificity. We've learned about particular organs, and in the case of Luxterna, the eye, which is slightly immune privileged, meaning that they don't suffer from uh, the issues of pre-existing antibodies or quite such a, an issue with T cell response to transduced cells. And Zolgensma, probably the crowning glory at the moment for the gene therapy field, approved for spinal muscular atrophy. It's a fantastic uh, breakthrough, which can really reverse um, a, a fatal disease. And we'll talk about some of the pricing issues of that, no doubt during either Jackie's talk or during Q&A afterwards. So I talked to there about in vivo gene therapy, some of the different platforms that we've got and, and the improvements that have been made which are really about working around the immune system and trying to avoid that immune response, enabling us to get enough vector to the target cell to transduce enough tissue to get the gene expression to treat the disease. 
And you can just cheat. You can get around all of those problems by taking the target tissue out of the body. And that's on the left-hand side of the slide here with ex vivo gene therapy. And clues to this really started a long way back with the uh, observation that you can treat some immunodeficiencies with bone marrow transplants. So SCID is a severe combined immunodeficiency. This is a genetic, genetic, a class of genetic disorders of bone marrow stem cells, which mean that they, patients can't, for example, make platelets very well, or they can't make B cells or T cells. So they have a, a profound immune liability. And it was known for a while um, that you could correct this by giving them a bone marrow transplant from a healthy donor provided it was suitably HLA matched. But it's very difficult to HLA match people. Um, so there was a, a driver to try to genetically modify bone marrow cells from the patient to tr try to connect, correct the genetic disorder. And indeed, that's what was done in a, a study starting in 1990 for uh, adenosine deaminase skid using uh, a virus called MMLV, Maloney murin leukemia virus, in uh, a number of different sites around the world. And this MLV vector was effective. It, it was good for inserting the gene into the DNA of the stem cells. And when you put those stem cells back into the patient, they were able to recapitulate the hematopoietic system, effectively curing the disease. So it looked very promising. And for several years thereafter, this technique was applied in a, in a range of severe combined immunodeficiency, Whisker Aldrich, XKID, uh, and others. And if anybody wants to see a reviews of, of the topics that I'm talking today, there's some very comprehensive references um, at the bottom of the screen, which I'd encourage you to have a look at. But the problem with this vector was that when the uh, the the DNA from the virus inserts into the genome, it tends to target areas of the genome which are highly expressed. And the genetic constructs that were used were not particularly specific in the promoter systems that they had, which caused upregulation of genes in the surrounding uh, DNA sequences, so-called transactivation. And unfortunately, several of those clinical trials experienced leukemia, which again, just rather like the issue with the in vivo gene therapy, slammed a break on the field for, for many years. And it wasn't really until a lentivirus variant was produced or, or developed um, that we got around a lot of the risks associated with the liabilities associated with integrating viral vectors. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased to say that uh, this field is now developed to the extent that there are several approved or two approved, three approved treatments, excuse me, where bone marrow from patients can be taken out, genetically modified and, and put back. And that's uh, zintaglobin, which is a treatment for beta thalassemia, lidmeldi, which is just recently approved uh, by, for, by a company called Orchard Therapeutics based in the UK. That's a treatment for metachromatic leukodystrophy, which is interesting in it. In, in itself because MLD is largely a disease of the central nervous system and it shows that cells from the hematopoietic system can take up residency in the central nervous system and because they're genetically modified to secrete the, the gene aryl sulfatase which is defective in those children they can cross correct a, a neurological disorder and Strimbellis, the other gene which is approved other gene therapy treatment which is approved which um, was the one that I was lucky enough to, to work on. Those therapies really pioneered the type of framework for allowing regulators to understand the issues about manufacturing and uh, control and patient follow-up that were necessary for so-called autologous gene therapy procedures. Autologous meaning that the starting material, the cells, must start and go back to the same patient. And this has been very important for the immune oncology field, which has now given rise to a variant of that CD34 stem cell gene therapy, and that's chimeric uh, antigen receptors. So you see in the middle of the slide there, um, first CAR T cell patient at uh, Children's Hospital Philadelphia. 
And so this was where the researchers took T cells from a patient with a B cell cancer and by introducing a gene therapy vector which encoded for a chimeric antigen receptor, which is essentially uh, what we would now call synthetic biology, but it encodes a protein which has an antibody on one end and then a signaling domain and the endogenous uh, intracellular signaling mechanism from the CAR T, uh, which means that when that T cell, which has been genetically engineered, comes into contact with the antigen, which the antibody naturally binds to, it activates the cell to divide and then attack the target tissue. In this case, it was CD19, which is um, exclusively expressed on B cells. So the treatment was basically training the patient's T cells to eliminate all of those B cells from their body. And in so doing, completely curing them of the the B cell lymphoma from which they were suffering. And that's given rise to a a massive amount of effort. Jackie, would you mind going to the next slide, please? In the immune oncology field, as can be summarized in this slide here, on the left-hand side of this diagram, you have a a bullseye chart which shows right in the middle there, yes, Carter and Chimera, the first chimeric antigen receptor treatments to be approved. And all the way around the outside, all of the fast followers from all of the other efforts coming from uh, new companies in the space and fast following large pharma. Chimeric uh, antigen receptor is not the only game in town. There are T cell receptor modified variants from companies like Adaptimmune in the UK and, and they offer perhaps a better hope of treating solid cancers, but the jury is still uh, really watching the evidence to see how that develops. And on the right hand side of the, the chart, we have the, uh, a summary of the in vivo gene therapy assets which are in development. You can see some of the approved ones in the middle, but again, a wave of treatments coming through development, which we hope will be successful. So I think my final slide uh, is the next one up, just to really emphasize how effective these treatments can be. You can see um, the first patient on the left hand side who received that CAR-T at CHOP and seven years free, uh, enjoying a healthy lifestyle. Treatments like Zolgensma can turn around the fortunes of, of, of young children. Um, metachromatic leukodystrophy is a fatal disease if left untreated. And the, the data with uh, Lidmeldi are, are fantastic. They really make a huge difference in Zolgensma. Uh, excuse me, um, Luxterna is a treatment for uh, uh, an ocular disease, which again can be transformational for patients. It's a one-off treatment, um, often associated with a, a short treatment of uh, immunosuppressive agents to, to prevent that T cell response. Uh, and the potential is really coming through to the fore now. And we're going to see a lot more of these things. So I think that's my last slide. We can stop here now for questions or we can carry on. And Sophia Izu, I'll let you guide us really on whether you want us to to carry on or um, whether you want me to hand over to Jackie now. Yeah, I think we can hand over to Jackie for now. Okay. Okay, I can take over now. Thanks ever so much for that, Jonathan. That was excellent. Um, I think I need to put my camera on. I don't know why it's off. Yeah. Um, so that was an excellent overview of the science and the background and the history. Um, and we thought that since it was a Friday night, um, it would be quite nice to just have quite a light introduction um, of the affordability and successes that we were asked to talk to. Um, so I'm going to take it to a, a different viewpoint. I'm going to talk much more operational now rather than the development of the processes um, and just give you a flavour for some of the considerations. Now it would let me control the the slides for Jonathan but unfortunately it's no longer let me control the slides. You may have to click on the screen because it might be trying to look at, um, there you go. Um, So 
In terms of the barriers for healthcare, this, you know, Jonathan's articulated how transformative these products are. Um, they truly are. People have got to the end of the treatment measurements, they've gone through three, four lines of treatment, they're at the end of the, their options, and you give them a CAR T, and um, quite a lot of them continue and survive, like Emily that Jonathan showed for seven, eight years. So they are transformative. However, um, they, they're quite disruptive technologies and therapies, and I'll go on and explain why. But that leads to quite a lot of complex requirements um, to, and considerations for the healthcare services, the supply chain and delivery chain. There's a high cost to them. Um, and as a result of this, um, and Jonathan sort of hinted that they quite often treat rare diseases um, uh, with very small patient sets. And as a consequence, they're being approved for licensure by the, the European Medicines Agency or by the, the FDA in the US, US with really limited data sets. And they're not the usual randomized controlled trial. Quite often they're small, single arm, no con con control arm um, trials, which leads to problems with reimbursement and the likes. So, but I will come on and talk about that. So, but as a consequence of all of these barriers, um, the successes that you wanted us to talk about are um, more complex. Um, and we've tackled at Catapult, we tried to look at um, the barriers and we tried to come up with some solutions for how you might overcome them. So I'm just going to talk about some of the ways we've looked at these and how the UK is a bit of a head of, a head of the field and some of the way that we've tackled some of these. So I will try and move us on. So in terms of the, the, uh, the scale up, so the, the success will be getting these products successfully used in the NHS. Now, they're really quite costly products in excess of a million pounds. Um, but there's, the cost is just one very small part of it. Um, and the NHS being the third biggest employer in, in the world is quite a big organisation and trying to bring in medicines that don't simply fit the here's a here's a pill please take it get better and go away introduces unique challenges so i'm just going to talk you through a challenge from an autologous product such as a, a car t and the challenge that that will uh, present to the nhs so as jonathan said they're autologous products so the first part of the process will be actually taking some cells from the patient um, and the challenges with that is um making sure that you have the correct licensure, first of all, to take the, 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 the cells, so maybe an aphidesis collection as it is here. You then have to track, there's a 30 year requirement in the regs to make sure that the cells that are taken from that patient can be traced all the way through to whoever receives them, might well be the patient themselves. You have to keep paperwork for that for 30 years. A really simple thing that hospitals usually only keep records for 10 years, already you can start to see what is quite a, a challenge because how do you change what is a really big system to introduce another added complexity of a 20, a 20 year additional storage for them. Um, you also, um, in the case of CAR T's, the patients quite often need to receive uh, immunosuppression so that when they receive their own cells back, they engraft properly. So you also have to create, coordinate the conditioning of these patients and ensure that the manufacturer of the product, which can take sometimes up to six weeks, um, is, is coincides with the conditioning of the patient. And the pa patient has to be well enough to, first of all, undergo the immune suppression, but then to receive the product at the end of it. So that, that's a challenge. The next challenge is the manufacturer. Um, Jonathan talked about, you know, we spend a lot of our time in, in Catapult and his group especially spends a lot of time looking at how we develop these products, how we increase the, the productivity of the products and increase their effectiveness, but also to drive down the cost of goods because they're really quite costly. So we need to do that. There's also the transport of the cells from the, from the patient, which may be in the UK, all the way to the US. Uh, the manufacturer then the product then needs to be brought back. Now that's relatively complex at any time, but if you think about what happened in COVID when there was no planes flying, you can imagine it becomes even more complex because if there's no planes flying, how do you get those products back here? You can't 
easily charter a plane. So, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of barriers that need to be considered because I'll remind you of my previous uh, slide where I said these patients have been immunosuppressed. So there's a really tight balance about getting the product back to the patient when they're ready to receive it. Um, there's also issues about the, the release of the product and um, whether it meets all of its batch specifications. If it doesn't and the patient's immunosuppressed, do you still release the product? All of these considerations need to be taken into account when you're trying to you know, get the patient ready. In terms of the supply chain, um, it's quite complex. They, they're quite often uh, travel in liquid nitrogen. That in itself is complex, but it also produces even really operational issues like to get a dry shipper, which contains the liquid nitrogen with the cells in them onto a plane. You have to have it on a pallet um, and that pallet needs to be able to be driven onto the plane. If that's only a little six seater plane, that can't happen. So you have to make sure that the plane that you are going to use to transport it can actually take the product and take the, the dry shipper. Moreover, once you get it back to the hospital, do you know that it can actually get through the hospital? So all of these things are all considerations that need to be built in. Also, quite often there might be a really short shelf life. I was involved with the release of a, a product um, which had a, a six hour shelf life. That brings quite unique challenges. It, you're getting down into radio pharmaceutics uh, shelf life almost. You know, so it's, it's something that your NHS has to be equipped for and has to have the systems in place to deal with. Also, um, my background is blood transfusion. I understand critically ha um, um, how important it is that the patient receives the correct cells. That's no less important here. So you have to make sure that the patient whom the, the cells come from receives their own cells back. If you're only producing 10 products a year and infusing them once a year at a hospital, the risk there is quite small. If you scale that up to tens of thousands of patients receiving products, not for, through the blood transfusion service, which is used to doing that type of matching, but through the normal pharmacy, you can imagine it becomes much more complex. It then arrives at the hospital, um, which is where the pharmacy comes in. They're not used to dealing with these type of products. They're used to dealing with products that um, come in solution or um, are in tablet form. They're certainly not used to dealing with living cells. It's a living cell product. So how do they learn how to handle that? How do they thaw it? How do they have the IT uh, services to, to ensure that it's the correct product for the patient? And then even something this simple as you would think of getting it from the cell lab to the ward, there might be a shelf life then of about 30 minutes. Now, if you imagine some of the big teaching hospitals where these products are being delivered, it could actually be at the other side of a, a city. So how do you get a 30, 30 minute shelf life to the other side of a city? All of this needs to be planned in advance. Um, and then the delivery to the patient, um, the, the actual tracking and tracing to that patient and recording that the patient received it and received the right product is challenging. Uh, can you do that on paper or do you need to rely on IT? If you rely on IT, the pharmacy have the correct IT system or is that sitting in the cell of the blood lab? Um, the training of the staff, the pharmacy staff, as I mentioned, aren't used to dealing with these products. How do we ensure that they're properly trained? How do we ensure that they the clinicians and the nurses are properly trained in how to administer these products. Again, just a lot more planning, a lot more thinking. And then the payment, um, that's quite complex and I'm gonna come on to that at the end. But in terms of the success that we're talking about, you, you wanted to talk about success, you can see that there's actually a number of barriers um, to the successful delivery of these products in the NHS. And one of the things I would say that we've been successful in the UK um, in was we, we acknowledged that these were unique challenges to the NHS. We acknowledged that we, had, we were re in a really fortunate position that we had a unified health service um, where we could actually trial some systems uh, for developers and, and accelerate their, their access into the, the healthcare and access to patients. So, the catapult approached the government and we said, we believe this is a barrier. We think that we could overcome this barrier if we were able to have, have a, a network of centres where we could start to test these systems. Through the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, uh, £30 million was released. 
And as a result, um, we, uh, we developed, which, and Catapult is coordinating it, what we call the Advanced Therapy Treatment Centre Network. So this is a network that spans the, the, the country. It has Northern Alliance, um, which is up um, in Scotland and the northeast of England. It has uh, IMAT, which is in Manchester, and all of the trusts in Manchester are covered. Midlands and Wales, which covers all of Wales and Birmingham and Nottingham. And we also work really closely with the London Advanced Therapy Group um, down in London, who cover all of the London hospitals. So it spans the whole country and we're using these centres centers as exemplars to start to tackle all of those and other issues that I identified in the last slide, to start to come up with processes and procedures and training so that the NHS is equipped to actually uh, deal with these products and deliver these products in a safe and efficacious way, but also in a cost efficient way um, that suits both the NHS and industry. So that's what we're working on just now. So albeit I, I told you all of the barriers, the success for the UK is this is a world first. We're working together with industry. There's uh, 50 industry partners involved um, and about 30 NHS trusts involved in hospitals. So we're working together collaboratively to come up with some solutions to those barriers. So that in itself, I would say, was quite a big success. Moving on to reimbursement. Um, the... We mentioned before that uh, these products are quite costly, you know, in excess of a million pounds quite often. So that's quite a high price. Um, and the way that cost effectiveness is looked at through the health technology assessments in the UK that's currently done, you know, it's done through NICE, um, is the, the way up the price against the affordability and um, whether uh, the, the data supports the, the use of the product in the NHS. So there's basically a balancing act between how efficacious are the products, does the data support the continued use of them, and should we recommend this high price? Um, so to do that, as I say, it has to be cost effective. NICE has to say it's cost effective, that it does bring about a significant improvement in people's uh, quality of life amongst other things. Um, now, the way that they do that is quite complex and it's certainly not for a Friday night, but one, one of the things that they need to do is take the data set that usually has to be quite robust um, and prove using that data that actually that there is a, a, a significant benefit and it persists. Now, we mentioned earlier that these products quite often are um, what we would call orphan products, so they're a very small patient group. As Jonathan talked about, they're quite often monogenic diseases in children um, who actually have very limited, if, if not no, uh, other treatment options. So the, the likelihood and the ethics in being a, a, allowed to run a randomised con control test and that patient group are really low. You don't have many patients, there might only be 10 of them in the whole entire uh, the entire world. And would it be ethical to actually do a randomized control test on them? So as a consequence, you end up with really small data sets. So the, the ability for NICE to quite confidently say that they actually are efficacious and this, ef this efficacy persists, which if we're claiming for a gene therapy could be lifelong, is really difficult. In fact, it's impossible where we are just now. So as a consequence, you quite often have um, follow-up. Um, you need to follow the patients further on. You need to be, they need to, NICE and the other HTA bodies have to have confidence that it's shown efficacy to a certain extent, but then quite often they will need follow-up data, as do the regulators. And then there's an affordability, there's a, there's a net budget impact test, which in, the, in England is slightly different in Scotland. Um, but in England, there's a £20 million per annum trigger point. Now, if each product is costing £1 to £2 million and you're treating a patient group in the UK that might be 20 patients, and quite clearly you're going above that trigger point. So that's another issue that has to be considered. And then it has to be commercially viable as well. The, you know, the, the people that are developing these, 
um, absolutely are looking at the, the best interests of the patients. However, they, they can't continually lose money. They have to at least break even, if not make a slight profit to allow them to reinvest that in further developments. So it also has to be commercially viable. So all of those things are, you know, create quite a, a dynamic uh, tension that has to be thought about and considered. And the, the, the work that we're doing with the ATTCs actually takes this into account too, because actually if you're, if you're driving down the cost of delivery by in increasing the, or streamlining the, the NHS's adoption of this, then that is going to, you know, make it more commercially viable, for instance. But as a consequence, it means that there's a lot of uncertainty, especially at the time of launch. And I suppose that uncertainty is, um, is uh, exemplified here. Uh, where we've got 11, sorry, I've, I've cut off the top of the, the, the slide there, but I think we've got 11 currently approved products, which uh, Jonathan talked about earlier. And of those um, products, only seven of, them, seven of them so far in the UK have secured some sort of reimbursement. Um, and a lot of that is very restricted. Now, actually in the UK, we're actually one of, we're quite an early adopter of these. If, if I'd shown you this throughout the whole of the Europe, you'd have seen that there was even less reimbursement guaranteed in some parts of Europe. So we're in an area of uncertainty about how these products will be reimbursed and how we go about affording this. And part of that is we have to look at different models, there's different types of schemes that manufacturers can choose to um, adopt or be encouraged to adopt by the, the payers. And you can look to discount the, the price and you can look for rebates or you can look for what they call the annuities or stage pay payments. Um, and the rebates and the stage payments or annuities are what we call um, outcome based uh, reimbursement schemes. And they're quite innovative and it's something that we're working quite uh, hard in the, in the UK to look at these. Um, they, they have various pros and cons, you know, this, this, um, in terms of discounts and rebates that for the manufacturers, you know, these can generate uh, revenue very quickly. Um, but they can actually impact on budgets for the NHS quite, quite highly. Um, the potential also might be that the, the product value will just diminish. Um, if you're given a, a large rebate, then the product could be seen to be undervalued. Whereas if you move to something like annuities or outcome-based uh, payment mechanisms, then in terms of the NHS, it, it has a smaller budget impact. Um, so it might be more widely, widely accepted throughout the NHS. For the manufacturers, it's a, it generates revenue more slowly. If you imagine that if you spread the, the payments over five or 10 years, then it might be easier for the NHS. However, if the, if the SME um, requires the, the revenue from that first product to finance the pipeline of products that are coming down the, the, the line, then that, that creates difficulties there. So, you know, there's a, there's a problem there. Moreover, the NHS actually isn't set up for doing these type of payments as, as it is, which is what we're looking at in the advanced therapy treatment centres as well. Because what happens with the NHS is the trust gets its funding for the year, a patient gets treated, they pay for that patient treatment, and that's then they roll over to the next year. If that patient treatment is being staged over five years, there's no mechanism currently for that to, to uh, take place. So, you know, how do we cover that? Do we have third party? party financing, is the Cancer Drugs Fund ex extended, and it might well be. So all of these type of considerations are something that have a significant impact on the ability to supply, both from the NHS point of view, or for you know any healthcare system, but also from the manufacturer's point of view, and it's something that needs to be considered really on early on in the, in the development path. So that is that a success? Is that a barrier? It certainly is an affordability issue, which is what we were talked asked to talk about today. So I think what we've tried to do today is, you know, Jonathan talked you through the history, the science, the products that have been generated. I've tried to give you a flavor of these are fantastic transformative products. However, they're really disruptive and difficult to deliver into a health service. 
Um, once you've sorted that out, how do you actually pay for it? You know, how do we gather the data? How do you use um, the IT systems within the NHS to gather the data, the long-term data to, to support the continued payment of these products? So I think I can leave it there. I think um, I finished my slides and I think Sophia, do we hand over to you now for, for questions? Yep, yeah, uh, I'll just get some questions up on the screen. We also have some questions from the audience as well. Sorry? I'll stop sharing my screen. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, can everyone see that? Can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Okay, so uh, we'll have got questions from the audience uh, following this. Um, and, and people who are listening in, if you have any questions, please feel free to type more questions into the chat box. Please don't be shy. Uh, the first questions we have are, for example, for number one, what is the future in gene therapy? Jonathan, do you want to take that one? Um, I'd be happy to. My video's been stopped, I've been told, so I hope I wasn't... You can choose to put it back on or you can't. ...staring out of the window or something. Um, thank you. I'm just trying to start it now. Yeah, that's true. Uh, what is the future of gene therapy? Well, if we knew the answer to that, that'd be great because I'd know who <laughs> best this. Um, but broad, broadly speaking, I think there are two areas of rapid growth. We talked about that autologous supply chain and the difficulty and costs associated with getting cells, if I was a patient, from me back to me. You can't scale the manufacturing process because it's one batch at a time per patient. The cost of goods is high and the cost of quality assurance is very high. So within that field, particularly in the immune oncology field, the future there is allogeneic therapies. So that's taking my cells, growing up a massive, great big vat of them, and then being able to use my cells to treat Jackie and everybody else on this call when they get ill. And the way that the field is moving in order to enable that is to knock out the T cell receptors on my cells so that they won't attack non-cancerous tissue or to knock out the HLA receptors on my cells so that they don't look foreign to the patient when they're given. And that's done with the knocking out the track locus or beta 2 microglobulin. And then supercharging these cells by, for example, knocking out PD-1 as a receptor, which cancer cells are pretty good at down-regulating the immune response against them. So we're seeing a combination of all of these effects being built into the T-cell immune oncology field in order to supercharge these cells and bring back, bring down that manufacturing and, and supply chain complexity. In the uh, in vivo gene therapy field, the big challenge is still remains the immunogenicity of the incoming vector. How do you get around pre-existing autoimmunity? Probably 30, 40% of the people on this call would have pre-existing immunity, e.g. antibodies, to those gene therapies that we've talked about today that are used for AAV. So it will make it very difficult to use those in you. And when, if the treatment wears off in the future, you've effectively had a vaccine against that gene therapy, so you won't be able to have it again. So we're looking at ways to get around that. T, uh, sorry, um, T reg cells are, are a type of cell type that can control the amount of immunogenicity in a very site-specific way. So can we call Tregs down to the site of interest using that kind of car type technology is very exciting. Or can we boost the amount of T cell, T reg cells in the, in the system using drugs like rapamycin? Or can we find really slippy, evasive uh, capsid types which don't cause that immune response? So it's really about in the autologous supply chain, switching to an allogeneic platform, and in the in vivo supply uh, or field, trying to get around the immunogenicity issues and making viruses which are just a bit smarter, because right now you need a very big dose of AAV because it's not a very effective virus when it comes to delivering its payload. Do you want me to stop or do you want to keep going? <laughs> I don't know. Is there anything that Jacqueline wants to add to that? Or? Um, I suppose. I suppose that 
two things I, Jonathan and I would probably add is the manufacturing. Jonathan's group is spending a lot of time on improving the delivery vehicles that are used to manufacture the products. So I suppose the, the future will be um, more potent products at lower costs, which should, you know, hopefully open up the field to, you know, developing countries and the like. So that's, I suppose that's one future. I'm just trying to think about non-scientific futures. And I suppose the work that we're doing in the advanced therapy treatment centers is you've got an NHS that's used to delivering these type of products. So it becomes much more routine. And in the US, for instance, they're, they're building CAR T uh, wings on, on hospitals where there's a whole different uh, treatment pathway or patient pathway for these patients. And that's an unusual model. Um, and it might well be what will become really standard practice, say, in 30 years. So I suppose the future is not just a change in the type of products, but how they're manufactured and then how they're delivered. Great. Thank you both for that. And the second question is, why did you choose to become an entrepreneur slash researcher? <laughs> Shall I go first again, Jackie? If you want. Um, uh, it's very kind of, of whoever it was to call me an entrepreneur, but I think... <laughs> I think anybody who's left Big Pharma and gone and started a company would know that my career path, which has been largely in, inside of, of large pharmaceutical companies, has been quite, quite a safe route to take. So perhaps I'll say all of the things that tempted me to want to become an entrepreneur. And really, if you look, if you, if you go back to that slide that I showed, and you look at those early fledgling companies like Bluebird Bio, who did that beta thalassemia trial. I, I think they, they formed, uh, I can't remember the exact date, a handful of people, I'm going to say around about 20, 2006, formed that company and they thought, we're going to go after this platform. We're going to do beta thalassemia and we're going to do um, adrenoleukodystrophy, two really cool projects, and they went after it. And then they pioneered that field. And because of what they'd learned, they were able to then jump onto the car bandwagon as well. And I was just checking it as preparation for this talk today. Bluebird Bio now employs over a thousand people and has a market cap of 3.5 billion pounds. The, there is nothing like the pharma industry for creating value. And it's not just about creating monetary value for the founders. That value comes from the, the potential of the technology and its application for good. And I can't think of anything better to live for than that, really. If, if you make a medicine that can then be used by the medical community. You can impact on uh, almost countless numbers of lives. And, and I think that there's no more honorable pursuit than that. I've got nothing to add on that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you for a lovely response. Um, and our third question from us is, uh, what would you advise me for future entrepreneurs slash innovators? I go first on that one, Jonathan. Of course, yeah. Um, I, I suppose, I suppose a real understanding of the journey that they're starting out on, um, and having an, a real understanding that their product might be the best product in the world. However, if you're not going to get paid for it, you're probably not going to go anywhere with it. Um, and I don't mean make millions. Um, if if it can't be bought and the NHS or whatever healthcare service can't provide it, then it's not going to go anywhere. And, you know, developing a really expensive gene therapy for the treatment of headaches, it's, it's not going to be cost effective. You know, so an understanding of what your, your target is going to be. I think Jonathan talked about, you know, developing a platform, understanding the science. Of course, that's your first step. But if you start moving towards a therapeutic aim, and I think really understanding the, the true cost of that, um, including the regulatory barriers, 
including what you will require from a clinical trial, but understanding that it actually is an affordable product at the end, I think is really important. It's not that sexy. Science is much more sexy, but it's actually crucial that, you, that people do understand that and, and take time to, to learn what they need to know, I would say. Jonathan? Yeah, I'd say come talk to the catapult. If you want to make a gene therapy medicine, come talk to us. We're here to help. Um, and there are so many ways to fall over. Uh, we're, all, we're all getting on uh, in years now, and we've seen a lot of those pitfalls, and we can help you avoid them. It could be a small thing like a patent that you didn't realise that you had to get as background IP to commercialise your idea, or it could be a really obvious thing like how the hell do you make enough of the stuff to be able to test it? Um, but we can help advise you about all of those things. And uh, as I said, right at the start of the presentation, we're not here to capitalize on your idea. We're here to help you capitalize on your idea. Okay, great. Thank you both. And now for audience questions. Uh, first one from Stephanie says, do you find that some areas of disease treatment, i.e. cancer, neurodegenerative, are more likely to get favorable reviews and be recommended by NICE? Um, th there might be a, a, a difference in the risk-benefit analysis in those type of diseases, yes. Will they get a more favourable outcome? Not if the data doesn't support them, no. Okay, and next question. Uh, I can, says, oh. can I just expand a little on that? Yep, sure, think, definitely. As... as that, that risk benefit analysis, key part of decision making during development. If there are already effective treatments for your disease, or the, sorry, excuse me, the disease you're seeking to treat, then it's more difficult to do those clinical trials because you need to prove a lot of safety before it's justifiable to take the risk. But if there are no pre existing treatments, then the unmet need is greater, so the risk benefit is greater. Uh, the benefit, um, the potential to do benefit is greater. So it makes it easier to get those clinical trials going. As Jackie was saying, when it comes to evaluation of the product, it's all about price per benefit, and that's risk adjusted price per benefit in terms of these quality adjusted life years, which uh, take into account if there are pre-existing cost-effective treatments on the market, like in cancer, if you could have a cheap chemotherapy, your treatment has to do a lot better than that cheap chemotherapy. So in neurodegenerative disease, where there are less pre-existing treatments, there's nothing there to beat from a, a, a price performance measure. But of course, neurodegeneration is one of the toughest areas to go into because disease biology is so poorly understood. Mm. Okay, and um, next question, which is uh, directed to um, Dr. Barry, which is, could crowdfunding be a helpful complement to support development and use of otherwise prohibitively expensive orphan drugs? Um, well, it, it's used successfully all over the world. I think, you know, I've, we've all read things in the paper. And um, so I think it's proven that it does do that. Um, however, I think this should be equity of access to pay for treatments for patients. Now, if a product is incredibly costly and no healthcare provider is providing it free of charge, um, then people will have to turn to different alternative ways of doing it. But the aspiration for Catapult would be that these products become so widely used that the cost of goods go down, that the manufacture becomes simpler, that the delivery becomes simpler. And as Jonathan says, you know, as we, as they become, as they show more efficacious, the more efficacious than the, the existing therapies, then it should be available, but this, that cost benefit. So crowdfund uh, funding is used. Um, I don't think it's something that I, we should use all of the time. With these type of products. Okay, uh, next question uh, by Elizabeth. Is there a route for Catapult slash NHS to work with groups who have raised venture capitalist slash private investor funding 
for clinical development of a gene therapy? If I understand the question properly, it's can can you come and work with the catapult if you've got an investable proposition and, mm -hmm. and you've got some support for it? Yep, that's what we're here for. Okay. And, um, and if you if you have a good idea with some good data to support, then the venture capitalists are there to want to hear about it. So uh, you don't have to worry about whether there's a route, it really depends on the quality of the idea and the amount of data that they will want to see to show that it's likely to work to, to uh, discharge some of the risks associated with being able to prosecute your idea. And that's what the Catapult can help you do, help you design your preclinical testing and help you look for, to, to, you know, develop your health economic model, um, check out your manufacturing process to see if it's scalable, et cetera, et cetera. We have time for one final question, uh, which is how can current PhD students or postdocs gain insights into this field? I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but I suppose like any field, um, if you're doing research, um, it's just reading papers, uh, looking at who's who are the developers in the UK? How did they develop that product? What sparked them to develop that product? How successful uh, are they? Just, you know, gaining an understanding of the landscape um, and finding out which particular bit you're interested in, I suppose. Um, Jonathan, would you add to that? I mean, yes, the challenge is with the question you said, in, insight into this field. The field of medicines development is massive and the field of cell and gene therapy is a very complicated part within that. So get, get finish your PhD, uh, get your postdoc in done and, and get a job in a company that makes medicines. That's the, the best way to learn about it. And right now, there's a big skills gap in this place. Um, there's more companies than there are smart people with the existing, with the skills that are necessary. So you, you're not be able to go walk in and do everything on day one, but if you just, just join a company that's on this mission um, and pick up the skills, it's a fantastic career opportunity right now. Okay, I think that's it for the questions. So that just leads me to thank Jacqueline and Jonathan. Thank you both for coming here today and taking your time to speak with us. And also to highlight our next event, Innovation Forum Cambridge, which if my, ah, it's working. Uh, our next webinar, which is on the 23rd of November at 6 p.m., which is concerning patents and access to medicines, challenges for the 21st century. So hope to see you all there. Again, thank you all for coming and uh, good evening. Thank you very much. Bye.